All right, welcome. This is part two on our um, exploration of um, colonial art from colonial Americas, um, in particular the Spanish colonization. What we're looking at is a folding screen. Um, this is referred to as a biombo, um, and this actually comes from the Japanese word, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, B-Y-O-B-U, um, which was a folding um, Japanese screen. And so it's a very complicated object. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, here you have this, this object created in Mexico um, that's um, being inspired by Japanese culture. So this was a folding screen commissioned by Jose Samantillo del Valdares, who was the Viceroy of Spain at the time. Um, it was most likely displayed in his palace, where it would have divided a ceremonial stateroom from a more intimate um, sitting room. And so the first scene that we're looking at here is um, the battle um, or the siege of Belgrade. And so this is the, the side that probably the men and the viceroy's um, visitors would have been looking at. On the other side is this really beautiful hunting scene. Um, and this is the side that would have been facing probably the more intimate room. And this is where the viceroy's wife and, and her um, attendants and um, company would have sat and would, would have had this view of the screen. So um, this object is really interesting because it shows um, an interest in Japanese objects coming into Mexico from the Philippines, um, which was also controlled by Spain. Um, and if you look closely, let me see if I can get some details. I just have details of the painting. Um, there's this sort of black lacquer base. Um, there's a little bit on top as well. And so um, this is uh, material really used by um, Japanese artists. And um, so a lot of these goods that were being traded in the Philippines were like these black lacquer boxes ivory and also these folding screens and so there was this demand and sort of this fascination with these types of um, Japanese objects and so this is a, a, a folding screen um, done by a Mexican artist um, and it's quite um, extraordinary you know you see these details of the black lacquer um, this sort of European um, sort of battle scene being depicted um, we look closely to um, the drawing or the paint. The painting is almost like a drawing. It's a very sort of thin paint um, and, and sort of done in a very light sort of translucent way. I'll show you some other um, details. So it's quite extraordinary. And then you also have this infusion of some of the sort of the Met Mexican culture with these sort of flowers and um, Castilian um, roses at the top. Let me see if I can write here. And so what's interesting is that Mexico, where this object was created, is in the center of this sort of network of exchange, this sort of trans-Pacific exchange, where objects are being transported to Europe, um, and then, you know, Europe to Mexico, and then Mexico, or, me well, sorry, the Philippines, and then to the Philippines to Japan, and then back again. And so that's why you have this really interesting sort of infusion of, of these different cultures. We will also be doing a segment looking at Japanese art as well. Um, the two scenes, the Siege of Belgrade and the hunting scene on the back, are um, based off um, European Dutch prints. And so they do, you know, have that, that um, European feel as well. Um, what's also interesting, too, is that um, the first wife of the Viceroy was a descendant of Moctezuma II. Um, and, and, and so this... Um, and so there's this tradition of, um, you know, indigenous, his, his wife was indigenous um, to the region. And so there's this tradition of this sort of older royal lineage that is still important, even though um, these people were conquered. Um, and indigenous people who were able to trace their lineage back to these older rulers um, often had certain benefits um, that others did not. And so there's this really interesting 
sort of dynamic between the indigenous people, you know, intermarriage, and then this sort of idea of class and status, um, you know, all happening at once. So let's take a look at the, the battle scene on the front of the screen. Again, this would have been viewed by the Viceroy. Um, and um, this would probably have served as really a sort of propaganda piece. Um, you know, this was a battle where the Habsburg Empire, um, the Spanish the, the Spanish family that ruled Spain at the time, is, is battling um, the Turks um, who were trying to invade the central part of Europe. Um, and this battle is um, a contemporary event, so the screen wasn't made too long after um, this event occurred. Um, and so the audience would have been, the, the battle, um, the audience would have been for the Viceroy and sort of important individuals um, that he would have um, had as company and really an expression of his um, political power. What's also interesting about this piece, and it and it's hard to see. I'm going to see if we can see some in the in the details. These really l sort of lighted areas where it seems like the light is sort of um, reflecting. This is actually shell inlay, and so this was an indigenous um, or local technique called enconchado, um, e n c o n c h a d o s. Um, and so it really is an interesting object because it's a biombo, um, this sort of Japanese, um, Mexican, um, inspired, um, object or folding screen, um, encrusted, um, with enconchado. And so, um, and it's really the only one, um, like it, um, that, that, um, has been, has been found. So it's, it's, it's really even more of a, you know, luxury object. Um, here are some other details. <clears throat> Let me see if I can magnify and, and actually look at this shell inlay. So this was actually a combination of oil painting and the shell inlay or mother of pearl um, that has been sort of encrusted throughout um, the composition. And it, it really is quite beautiful. And if you can imagine this screen being in, in, in a room sort of lit by candlelight, it probably was um, quite beautiful and exquisite looking. So an object like this not only would have been um, an expression of sort of the uh, political power of Spain and the Viceroy and the sort of propaganda piece, but it also um, shows you how um, profitable Spain was becoming or the Viceroy was becoming with this sort of exportation of, um, you know, tobacco, um, silver, um, that they were able to um, excavate. Um, from the New World, and so um, through trade, uh, you know, people were making a lot of money, and so the Viceroy um, could really afford to have a very lavish object like this. Um, this is one of um, our next pieces that we're going to be talking about, um, and this is an image of the Virgin Mary. Um, and after the defeat of the Aztec capital um, in 1521 and the establishment of the Spanish Viceroyalty of New Spain, um, again, this was Spanish rule in Mexico, Central America, and parts of the United States, southwestern parts of the United States between 1521 and 1821, the Virgin Mary became one of the most popular themes for artists. Um, one Marian cult image eventually became more popular than others, however, and this was referred to as the Virgin of Guadalupe, also known as La Guadalupana. Her image is found everywhere throughout Mexico today, gracing churches, chapels, homes, restaurants, vehicles, and even bicycles. And here's a close-up. Um, many people consider the original image of Guadalupe to be an archer poeta, A-C-H-E-I-R-O-P-O-I-E-T-A, or an image not made by human hands, and so it was divinely created. Um, some consider the image the product of an indigenous artist named Marcos um, um, Kipak, uh, or Chipak, C I P A C, um, who was working in the 1550s. Um, the original image um, is still enshrined in the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico, 
city today. Um, and her imagery, this imagery in particular, comes from um, the book of Revelation. Um, so when we look at this image, we see how um, the Virgin Guadalupe averts her gaze and clasps her hands together in piety. Um, she stands on a crescent moon and is um, supported by a seraph or a holy winged being or an, or an angel. A seraph is spelled S-E-R-A-P-H. Um, she wears Mary's traditional clutter, um, colors, including a brilliant blue cloak over her dress. Um, she does have some roses um, that are, you know, these sort of, this, this idea of embroidered roses decorate her sort of rose-colored glass, I mean, her dress. Um, and then she's also adorned with these gold stars in her cloak as well. And then there's sort of this mand um, mandora of light or, you know, sun that, that shroud that shrouds her and so there is this um, speaking of the woman of the apocalypse and and this is how she is described in the in the book of Revelation um, the image of Guadalupe relates to immaculate conception imagery which drew aspects of its symbolism again from the book of Revelation and the Song of Songs for instance the book of Revelation describes the woman of the apocalypse as a clothed as clothed with sun as we can see here this um, mandala of sun or these sort of you know she's bathed in light with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head um, instead we see that the stars are sort of embedded into her cloak now 12 golden rays frame her face and head and again this is another direct reference um, to the crown of stars here is a, another example of a virgin of Guadalupe um, this was done by Manuel de Aranha, Aranho. Um, this is oil on canvas. Um, and this is probably a, a replica of, of the original. Um, some of the attributes um, associated with the, the Virgin of Guadalupe is the ashen skin. If you look here, her skin looks kind of gray and dark. Um, and this is a subject of some discussion. It's possible that she represents um, an indigenous Madonna. Um, however, the Virgin Guadalupe in Spain, um, after whom Mexico's Guadalupe is named, um, I'm sorry, the city is called Extra Madura, E X T R M A D U R, Spain, and this is um, this is what Mexico's um, Virgin Guadalupe is named. Is black skin is a black skinned Madonna, a, de a direct reference to Mary's beauty based on the passage from the Song of Songs, I am black but beautiful. Black Madonnas were popular long before Guadalupe's appearance in Mex Mexico, and so it's possible that her ashen skin um, situates her within this sort of pre-existing um, tradition. So again, this really infusion of, of these sort of Christian, you know, Christian iconography um, with, you know, this indigenous culture as well. So um, today, millions travel annually to the, the Basilica um, to glimpse at the original image. Again, I think this is the original image, which visitors see while sort of zooming beneath it. Um, and I'm sure it's quite um, chaotic. The original shrine devoted to Guadalupe on a hill above the Basilica marks the site of her sort of initial miraculous appearance. Um, her miraculous revelation was to a man named Juan Diego. Um, the story associated um, with her with her appearance varies depending on on who's telling it or the author. But the general story goes um, something like this: um, In December 1531, um, a converted um, Nahua, and this was sort of a these are descendants from the Aztec um, people named Juan Diego was on his way to Mass as he walked up the hill um, of um, Tepec Yac, formerly the site of the shrine to the Aztec mother goddess, one of um, the Aztec um, goddesses. Guadalupe appeared to him as an apparition calling him by, his, calling him by name in Nahuta, um, the language of the Nahu who were again descendants from the Aztecs. According to one textual account written 
Um, Juan Diego described her as a, as dark skinned with garments as brilliant as the sun. Um, some of these, and, and this particular one I think is encrusted with, um, in conchata. This is a sort of shell inlay technique that we saw with the uh, Biombo, the folding screen that we looked at earlier. Um, and so the rest of the story goes that um, Juan Diego asked the bishop at the time to construct a shrine um, in her honor on the hill. After recounting the story, the bishop did not believe Juan Diego and requested proof of this miraculous appearance. After speaking again with Guadalupe on two other occasions, she informed Juan Diego to gather Castilian roses growing on the hillside out of season inside his tilma. A tilma is a, is a type of native or indigenous cloak um, that people wore. Um, when Diego um, opened his tilma before bishop, the bishop, the roses spilled out, and a miraculous imprint of Guadalupe appeared on it. Um, immediately, bishop, the bishop began construction of the shrine on the hill. Um, images depicting Guadalupe um, became very um, prolific in the 17th century as devotion to her in as devotion to her increased. Um, Prince paintings, um, again, these sort of enconchados, these oil paintings combined with shell or mother of pearl inlay um, were created that replicated the original, um, the original image. Um, sometimes artists included inscriptions that mentioned the representation as a true copy of the original image. In this um, particular image, the artist Manuel de o Ariano um, writes, um, he, he in fact writes after the original, um, Tocada el, origi el original on his um, 1691 version of the Guadalupe. Um, I think this is the one that you do need to know for the college board. I'll have to double check. I'll put a red star on the one that um, that is represented. Um, and this statement suggests that the artist based their work on the original, which was very important. Um, because it was thought that some of the power of the original image, if it were, co you know, if someone copied from the original image, would be transferred to the, the replica. So, you know, it was better to do a replica from the original and not a replica from the replica. It wouldn't have the same um, sort of divine powers associated with it. Um, besides replicating the original image, artists often included the narrative of the miracle, um, as we see here represented in the four corners of the composition. Um, here's another version. This is a later version done in 1824 where you can see they have the narrative of the miracle. And then also um, these Castilian roses that were described in, um, in the miracle that um, Diego observed. Um, are incorporated in the iconography as well. You can see them here. So again, you know, these, these images are important because they really do show this sort of infusion of um, European um, Christian iconography and then, you know, this mingling of indigenous um, uh, culture as well. Um, this is our next work that we're going to be looking at. Um, so this, these are, we're going to be looking at a series um, of paintings. Um, this was done by Jose Joaquin Megon. Um, the painting is um, entitled El Mestizo, um, the Matizo, and this was done during the second half of the 18th century. It's oil on canvas. Um, it was made in New Spain, which again was a Spanish um, Spanish colony in Mexico. Um, and when we look at the painting, it displays um, a Spanish father and an indigenous mother with her son. And it belongs to a larger series of works that seek to document the inner ethnic mi mixing occurring in New Spain, New Spain among Europeans. Uh, indigenous people, Africans, and existing mixed um, race population. Um, this genre of painting known as pinturas de castas um, or cast, cast paintings attempts to capture reality, um, yet they um, are very fictional as well. Typically casta paintings um, displayed a mother, father, and a child, sometimes two children, 
Um, this family model is possibly modeled on depictions of the Holy Family showing the Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and Christ as a child. Costa paintings are often labeled with a number and a textual inscription that documents the mixing that has occurred. The numbers and the textual inscriptions on Costa paintings create this sort of racial taxonomy akin to the sort of idea of scientific scientific taxonomy. In this way, Costa paintings speak to enlightenment um, concerns, specifically the notion that people can be rationally categorized um, categorized based on their um, ethnic um, makeup and appearance. Um, usually these paintings um, are, you know, are commonly produced in sets of 16, as you can see in this example here. Um, and then sometimes you occasionally see, they're usually on these little individual canvases, but occasionally you sometimes see these little vignettes on a single canvas. Um, costume, costumes, accoutrements, activities, um, setting, and um, flora and fauna, these are all um, aids that are used to um, racially label the individual within these works. So there are these sort of symbols that sort of try to racially identify um, the individual or, or the model of the painting. Um, the first position of the Costa series is always a Spanish man and an elite um, indigenous woman. Um, again, we talked a little bit about this. Um, we looked at the Biomba, the, the folding screen that we saw in Mexico. Remember the Viceroy's at the time, his wife was um, an indigenous woman who was able to trace her lineage back to um, Moctezuma II, and so she was sort of, um, you know, had other privileges that other um, indigenous people did not. Um, and so, also accompanying the couple um, is their offspring, a uh, Mestizo, M-E-S-T-I-Z-O, which denotes a person born of these two parents. As the Costa series progress and the mixing increases, some of the names used in the Costa paintings to label people demonstrate this kind of social anxiety over this inter-ethnic mixing. Um, and so often some of these can be um, quite um, pejorative. Um, pejorative means this idea of expressing um, sort of disapproval. Um, here's a, a detail. Um, Costa paintings convey the perception that the more European you are, the closer to the top of the social and racial hierarchy you belong. Pure-blooded Spaniards always occupy the permanent position or prominent positions in Costa paintings and are often the best dressed and most civilized. Clearly, Costa paintings convey the notion that one's social status is tied to one's perceived r racial makeup. This is our next work, and this is the one that you are responsible for um, on your um, 250 list um, from the AP College Board. Um, this, this painting displays a simple composition. We see a mother um, and father flanking two children. Um, one of whom is a servant actually carrying the couple's baby. Um, the mother is indigenous and she's dressed in a beautiful um, sort of traditional garment worn by the indigenous women from Central America. At that time, it, she has lace sleeves. She's wearing this sort of sumptuous jewelry. Um, she turns to look at her husband as she gestures, as he, as she gestures towards her child. Her husband, who wears a very sort of French style European um, costume, um, including a powdered wig, gazes down at the children with his hand either resting with his hand um, resting on his wife's arm or the child's back. It's kind of hard to, t to tell in the picture. The young servant looks upward to the father. The family appears calm and harmonious, even loving. This is not always the case, however. Often, as um, series progressed, um, this this discord um, might erupt among families, um, or they are um, displaced and tattered, torn, or sort of these unglamorous surroundings. Um, people also appear darker as they become more mixed. Um, Costa paintings from the second half of the 18th century, in particular, focus more on families living in less ideal conditions as they become more racially mixed. Earlier series, um, 
like this one done by Juan um, Rodriguez um, Juara, often displayed all families wearing more fanciful attire. Here's a detail too where you can actually see um, the costume um, that the wife is wearing. Um, so who would commission these works and why? Um, existing evidence suggests that some of these Costa series were commissioned by the Viceroys or the stand-ins for the Spanish King in the Americas um, who brought some Costa series to Spain upon their return. Often series were commissioned for important administrators. However, little is known about the patrons of Costa paintings in general, yet we can infer, infer to a degree who might have commissioned such paintings because Costa paintings reflect um, this sort of increasing social anxiety about inter-ethnic mixing. It is possible that the elite who claim to be of pure blood and who likely found um, the, the delusion of pure um, bloodness um, alarming um, were among these individuals who commissioned um, Costa paintings. All right, so this concludes um, our um, video on colonial America. Um, we'll be picking up um, in our next segment with later 18th century and early 19th century art. As usual, please go back and look at the videos from the Khan Academy that I post along um, with your PowerPoint so you can get a better understanding of some of these works of art.